Now the Jews themselves weren't saying they could never have another book of scripture after Deuteronomy because obviously their Tanakh has the prophets and the writings. Their Old Testament, as they call it, have other books. So they believe in ongoing uh, speaking from God and prophets coming and telling them things. But the prohibition against adding or taking away is to this exact Torah, this exact teaching that Moses is giving in Deuteronomy. So what do we say to that? Well, the New Testament is quite clear that the Lord Jesus is the one who fulfills not only the law, but all of the Old Testament scriptures. And that in Luke 24, he would show the two on the road to Emmaus all the things concerning himself and the law and the prophets and the writings. And likewise, we get statements in the New Testament, like in Romans 10, where we're told that Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. So rather than abrogating the law or setting aside the principles that God was revealing there, the Lord Jesus really fulfills them. The Lord Jesus shows us what the law was all about. And then just as we said yet last night, that none of us could keep the law, that the law is the thermometer that shows us we're sick. It also shows us we need a savior therefore. If the thermometer can't heal you, you need something or someone who will, and that's the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is the fulfillment of the sacrificial system. It was all pointing to him. He's the fulfillment of the festival system, the fulfillment of all the types and shadows, not to mention the prophecies of the Old Testament. The other question Brother O'Connor asked was, well, what if we say to the Mormons who say they have the Book of Mormon? And rather than being very involved in that discussion, let's just say it this way, that compare that to what we already know to be scripture. Compare the Book of Mormon with the Bible that God has given us. Is the God of the Book of Mormon the same God as the God of the Bible? And you find out they're very different in character. You find out even that, as I was telling Ezekiel, one of the early Mormon leaders said, as we now are, so God once was. As God now is, so we may become. Wow. So one historian writing a book about the Mormon church, and I don't think he was an evangelical believer, he wrote a book and called it One Nation Under God, plural. Because that's really where Mormon theology is taking you, that you can attain to Godhead. Now, we look at the gospel of the Book of Mormon. Is it the same gospel? Well, no. Not the Book of Mormon, not Doctrines and Covenants, which is another of their holy books, not the Pearl of Great Price, another book they would consider scripture. These all teach a different gospel. And in Galatians 6 1, not 6 1, in Galatians 1, excuse me, uh, Paul says there, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we preach, let him be accursed. So when you get these things that are supposed to be added revelation, whether it's somebody who's charismatic and says, I've got a word from the Lord, you compare it to scripture. How does this fit with scripture? And same thing goes for the books, even more so, in false religion, in the cults, and so forth. Compare it with the Bible. And it's not even close. It's not the same thing. Plus, you want to get people to the Bible anyway. That's the power of God. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. And it's only in the Bible we have it revealed. So we want to take people to Scripture. Now, I only have about 25 minutes till supper. So we want to be somewhat in haste here. We're only going to cover just a little bit left in Chapter 4, I think, and maybe get into Chapter 5. Already I'm a little bit behind, but we'll try to make better time tonight. But it's okay. It's been profitable discussion, so I'm not sad. And again, I already told you we're not going to cover every verse in the book, so I'm just being true to my word. Now, we were talking about Israel's unique position and that they were to be this special people that was an example to the world. And that continues as he talks about how God revealed himself to them. They have this special relationship with God. So look at Deuteronomy 4.11. Then you came near and stood at the foot of the mountain, and the mountain burned with fire, 
to the midst of heaven with darkness, cloud, and thick darkness, and the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sound of the words, but saw no form. You only heard a voice. He declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. And the Lord commanded me at that time to teach you statutes and judgments that you might observe them in the land which you cross over to possess. Take careful heed to yourselves, for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire, lest you act corruptly and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that's on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, the likeness of any fish that's in the water beneath the earth, and take heed lest you lift your eyes to heaven, and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, all the host of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. But the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people, an inheritance as you are this day. And so we get this tremendous revelation that they get close to the mountain and they have this visible demonstration of the glory of God, the mountain burned with fire. Now, interestingly, Hebrews 12 is going to refer back to this passage, and it's even going to quote it outright at the end of Hebrews 12. But Hebrews 12 kind of sets the tone for us very well. He says in Hebrews 12, 18, For you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and that burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest and the sound of the trumpet and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word should not be spoken unto them for any anymore, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceedingly afraid and trembling. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. See that you do not refuse him who speaks, for if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. Now this, yet once more, indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may be removed. Therefore, since we're receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence in God, with reverence and godly fear, verse 29, for our God is a consuming fire, which is a direct quotation from our passage here in Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 24, you see, for the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Now Hebrews sets the tenor of the thing for us. This was a scary experience to be confronted with this visible visible demonstration of the glory of God, with the holiness of his fire. You know, when people had any kind of a vision of God's glory in the Bible, it was never banal. It was never commonplace. It was never this idea that, oh, well, I, I saw Jesus and he spoke with me for 15 minutes and told me what heaven was like. So I came home and I wrote a book and now it's a bestseller and I'm going on Oprah Winfrey to talk about it. Sorry, that's rubbish, okay? People have experienced so-called experiences with angels and spiritual beings and all kinds of things they say. But anybody that's ever encountered the real living God, it is an experience that shatters them, that shakes them to the core of their being. And the Lord did this at Sinai because he wanted that nation to know at the beginning, yes, you're a privileged people. Yes, you have an uncommon benefit. 
I've selected you to be my people. What nation, he says in chapter 4 here of Deuteronomy, has ever been like you? Has anybody ever heard of God forming another nation within a nation and taking them out and making them an inheritance? Did God ever pick any other nation? In chapter 7, he's going to talk about this. And he's going to say, the Lord our God did not pick you because you were greater and more numerous and more powerful than other nations. The Lord in grace wanted to come down and make a people and decided to make it Israel. Picked them long before they were around as a nation. Called Abraham and made these promises to them, right? And made them a nation so that they might serve him. Unless they become kind of haughty and humdrum about it and say, well, the Lord's picked me, so I'm better than you, you know? It's amazing to me how you can get, and I don't want to be over, well, never mind. I'm not going to go there. I don't have time. Anyway, let's just say that certain people that arrive at an appreciation of certain truths in the Bible, <coughs> it's amazing how haughty we can become, right? <laughs> that we get so proud of the fact that we know that God is everything and we're nothing, that then we walk around and look down at other people and say, well, I'm better than you are. Whether it's other people that are unbelievers or other people that are believers. Listen, a believer ought to be the last person who's ever proud. Now, I know we are. And I know it's the constant struggle. And if you don't struggle that way, you're a very large minority. Uh, a very infinitesimal number of believers that's on the earth. I mean, there's so very few that have not struggled in some way, shape, or form with pride. <laughs> and as human beings, we need to come back to who God is and remember the greatness of our God, the holiness of our God, that our God is a consuming fire. Now, we live in a casual age, right? We live in an age when people sort of want to lower things and make everything egalitarian. And even, I understand, I mean, some of it, some of that old school stuff doesn't make sense. You know, I don't understand why certain restaurants you needed to wear a jacket and tie to go into. My question is, can you use a knife and fork and are you hungry? You know, that would seem to me to be enough. But there were places that said no. We want to maintain a certain standard of clientele. And the kind of people that we're feeding, you know, the sort of people that come to uh, some of the establishments that Brother Ezekiel has run in the past, uh, we want to dress up for this. We want to sort of keep out the riffraff, right? And have these people come because this eating, it's not just a matter of taking in nutrition and getting your daily dose of protein and carbohydrates. It's an experience. You're coming and you're going to enjoy this certain food and you're going to enjoy this certain drink and you, you've got to really enter into what's going on here. This isn't just another meal. This is to be an event, right? Now that's how Wolfgang Puck feels about Spago. That's how um, Bobby Flay feels about whatever restaurants and Emerald Legacy and all these other celebrity chefs. You know, it's not just food. It is something great. It's a happening. Well, if people can feel that way about food, how much more interacting with the living God? Now, we have to remember our God, Deuteronomy says it, but also Hebrews in the New Testament says it, our God is a consuming fire. So we have to be in earnest. There has to be this real fear of the Lord. I know we love the Lord because he first loved us. I know we appreciate the Lord's mercy that is granted to us, but we should never get the feeling that the Lord is like us, that the Lord is on our level, that the Lord and, and we are buddies. The Lord brings us into unfathomable intimacy. He lets us call him Abba Father, doesn't he? The Lord Jesus is truly that friend who sticks closer than a brother. The Lord Jesus is not ashamed to call us his brethren, Hebrews chapter 2 says. But that's all coming from his side. I wouldn't think of strolling into the Oval Office and saying, Donnie boy, 
How you doing, baby? Long time no see. Now, it doesn't matter what politics I may have or not have or what I think, and I could have said the same thing about President Obama or President George W. Bush or President Clinton or George H. W. Bush or name your president. I'm of the old kind of way of thinking that the powers that be are ordained of God, and so they deserve a certain amount of respect. They certainly warrant our prayers, don't they? That's what First Timothy 2 says anyway. And therefore, to go into the presence of a human dignitary and to be rude or to be overly familiar, that would be something reprehensible to think about, wouldn't it? And you can think in the Bible about the great men and women of God who have interacted with royalty. People like Joseph, who when they're bringing him out of an unjust imprisonment, wrongfully accused of crimes he didn't commit, taken to a place and treated badly. When Joseph is brought out of that prison, before he goes into Pharaoh's presence, he goes and shaves, and he puts on a clean garment. I don't know about you, but I'd say no. Take me in my prison orange jump shoe, or whatever their ancient equipment was. Take me looking grubby. I hope I have a beard like those guys on Duck Dynasty, because I want him to feel what his injustice has done. I want him to feel what the corruption that is rampant in the highest circles of Egyptian society have done. No, that's not Joseph. Joseph comes and he speaks respectfully to Pharaoh. And we could say the same thing about Moses, that though he goes into a later Pharaoh's presence and speaks with the boldness of a man coming with a message from God, there's still respect. He doesn't assail the man personally. But he speaks in the name of the Lord to the man. Now, that's something we have to understand, that if, if that's how it is with human dignitaries, how much more the Lord? That, yes, we appreciate the instant access we have to our Savior, to God the Father. We appreciate the intimacy of having God make his dwelling in us. You know, he says, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, or many dwelling places. That word only occurs twice in the Bible, that word dwelling place, that specific Greek word that we translate abode or dwelling place. The other is later in John 14 when he says, the Father and I will come and make our abode in you. We'll make our dwelling place in you. Imagine that. God will come and live within us. We're going to go live with God for eternity in heaven, but we don't have to wait for it. God will come live within us in the form of the Holy Spirit coming. And by that, we can commune with Father and Son. But it should never be something that we ever forget the great grace that's been shown us, that we don't deserve this, and that God is higher and holier than we. And so right at the beginning, God wants them to know these things. Now, he warns them specifically about idolatry, and we're going to talk about that more when we get to the Ten Commandments. It's kind of interesting that God so strongly warns them against idolatry here, and the description of all the things that they could make an image of, it's a grocery list of what you find in Romans 1, right? And Romans 1 is the story of how when people refuse to glorify God, in other words, they don't give God his proper place, neither are, th are thankful, they don't show thanksgiving to God, that they turn to things that are less than God, and then they worship those things. So they start out worshiping man, and then they worship animals, and they worship right down to creeping things. And not surprisingly, worshiping these things, they go on to act bestial. If you worship the beasts, you'll act like a beast. And that's exactly what they do. But the interesting thing is that the Lord talks about all these things they can look up and see, and he describes it in verse 19 as a heritage that the Lord has given to all people. So the Lord gives us the stars and the sun and the moon to enjoy, not to deify, not to make them a God that we worship. And the interesting thing is that the Bible tells us the very things that people will worship are things that God created 
to remind us of who the true God is. So Psalm 19, for example, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament show of his handiwork. Not so that we can be impressed with Andromeda or impressed with, you know, the constellations in our solar system or whatever. No, so we can be impressed with a God who's so much bigger than these stars, which are about the biggest thing we can imagine. You know, this tremendously big universe we're living in was made by a God, if I can put it this way, who's bigger than the universe he made. He's not contiguous with it merely. He's not a part of the universe. And the universe isn't an extension of him. He's distinct. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There's a difference. And yet, man has this tendency to turn and worship lesser things. He says, no, I'm giving you these things as a heritage, things you can enjoy, and things that are to speak to you. And he brought you out of the iron furnace. You think of the trauma of that image to be his people and inheritance as you are this day. Now, you know, the same language is used in our day of the church, that Ephesians 1 talks about him having an inheritance for, for himself in us. It talks about us having an inheritance in him. That's true. But it also talks about him having an inheritance in us. And that's an extraordinary thing, that God doesn't need us but he chose us, that he wants us. For what? To be his people, to be his inheritance. Now, my children are very big on wish lists. They have their own wish list going on Amazon. And I think they have one with their mom in an Excel file. And whenever we're somewhere, we go a lot of places, and they see something they like, they say, oh, mom, put this on my list, you know? So they got this list. So if a birthday or Christmas or something should arise where a, a gift is necessary, we don't have to think about it too hard. We've got a ready-made list, usually with prices attached, that will tell us what it is that they want, right? And you say to yourself, what could the God who made everything possibly want? Well, the answer is he wanted Israel. He wanted that people for himself. He wanted an inheritance in them. Now, it was going to take a lot of work in them. I don't know if any of you knew Paul Amos, Brother Randall's father, but he used to be fond of saying, he's kind of a character, a little bit rough hewn from West Virginia and Western Pennsylvania in his life, and he used to say it like this, when God wanted a bride for his son, he had to come to a dung hill. <laughs> and that's putting it pretty strongly, but it was not overstated. It wasn't an exaggeration. That in order to make Israel what he wanted them to be, God had to come and take a people that previously were nothing, and God had to invest a tremendous amount of work that is now extended over millennia, thousands of years, and God's still not done with it, till he makes Israel be what he wants them to be, till he's able to rule and reign one day on earth in their midst. And they're still not there yet. Same thing with the church, brethren. That we're still a far cry of what we're going to be. But the end is not in doubt. The Lord wants to make us his people, wants to make us his bride, wants to fulfill all the things he's talked about. And he promises us these things. And he warns them about forgetting the covenant and worshiping these idols. And he talks about God being a consuming fire in verse 24 and says he's a jealous God. And he says, verse 25, when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger, Notice this phrase, verse 26. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. Now that's a phrase that occurs about 26 times in the Bible. I think it occurs three or four notable times in Deuteronomy. We'll find it again, for instance, in chapter 30, when Moses is going to basically lay down the blessings and the cursings for the nation and sort of give them his swan song that he's going away 
but that if they depart from the Lord, heavens and earth are going to witness. The creation itself, in other words, is going to bear witness. And when you go to a passage like Isaiah 1, you remember Isaiah 1, where he looks at Israel and he says, Israel is so messed up. They are so sick. There's not any soundness in them from the top of their head down to the sole of their foot. And he actually uses that same phrase in Isaiah 1. I call heaven and earth to witness against you. And Haggai is going to use that type of phraseology. And so is Joel. And so are other prophets. They're going to say, heaven and earth to bear witness. It's like the Lord calling man into court, calling Israel in this case, into court, and saying, bear witness against you. Here the Lord did all this for you. Here the Lord revealed himself to you. The Lord made you his nation, and yet you departed and you worship these false gods. He says, I call heaven and what earth to witness against you this day, that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. And you will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will bribe you. You will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. And that's reminiscent of both Psalm 115 and Psalm 135 that talk about idols in just that way. They're vanities. They're empty of any reality and any truth. They can't do a single thing because they're imaginary, aren't they? They're fabrications. They're inventions of men's imaginations. Now, the fascinating thing is not that God says he'll do this, because a God who redeems that nation out of the bondage they were in, brings them out of the iron furnace, as he said he would, reveals himself, promises them a good land, offers to have a relationship with them, to treat them like his own family, so to speak, and yet for them to turn from him to non-entities, to idols, to, to vanities, we'd say, I'm not surprised that God comes in and judges them and scatters them. And yet, at this time, it's probably 1405 BC. Others would say 1400. Okay, it's around that. Depends if you date the Exodus at 1445 or 1440, obviously. Doesn't matter too much to me. The bottom line is, it's going to be over seven centuries. Now, that's a long time, isn't it? Over 700 years, till God takes the 10 northern tribes and carries them away into Assyrian captivity and scatters them. And it's going to go on for uh, more or less almost another 150 years till 586 BC when God brings in the Babylonians and carries away the two southern tribes. And the wonder of it is not that God does that. Because the story of the Old Testament is how they serially are unfaithful. How they are continually spiritually adulterous. Read the book of Hosea. And you get a good sense of the betrayal, the disloyalty, the unfaithfulness, the rampant sin of regularly turning from the Lord and of looking for love in all the wrong places, especially spiritually speaking, as they turn to idols. Why does it take God all these centuries to scatter them? Because God, even though he's holy, even though he's a consuming fire, God is also long-suffering. God is also merciful, as we've been saying. And even when God scatters them, he still tells them, I'm going to regather you one day. And you read about the Lord in Revelation sending out his angel to gather out his people from the four winds of heaven. And you read about the Lord regathering that remnant of Israel in the future tribulation and bringing these people to Jerusalem. And just when the Gentile nations say, good, we'll wipe them out and we'll solve this Middle Eastern problem once and for all, the Lord comes forth from heaven to fight for them. The Lord comes forth to rescue and deliver them. And the Lord makes them his people and goes in and rules over. Now that's the wonder of our God, brethren. Some of this you read and you say, man, that sounds hard. Man, that God is so rough on them. No, he isn't. 
He's slow to anger, really, because in our time, this unfolds over a very long period of history. And even when God shows his judgment toward them, it's tempered by his mercy. And it's never to totally eradicate them. It's true. Individual Israelites may perish, and generations even may go through very lean spiritual times. But the light is never totally extinguished. And as we said before, the problem, the promises rather, that God promises to them are never completely negated. They're never null and void. They're still in force. It's just they await a future day when God will do it. But some brother, please close our time in prayer while thanking God for the food. Thank you for bringing us here today. We listen to your moments of the Lord and we pray for 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 the Lord and we pray